Hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar on cancer screening, catch it early, your health is your wealth. We invite everyone to sit back and relax while we have a candid conversation with our panel about what's new in cancer screening, including cervical, gastrointestinal, and breast cancer. Before we continue, we would like to thank the volunteers who have helped us develop this webinar. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are situated on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of these lands, which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations peoples that call this nation home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we can, each in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. My name is Arisha and I'm a registered nurse by training. I'm excited to be moderating today's presentation and look forward to learning about practical tips on how to take cancer screening into our own hands. I'm delighted to have with me three experts, Dr. Alicia Nancy, Dr. Usman Hamid, and Dr. Namira Ali Mohammed joining us today. I'm also delighted to introduce Shireen Jiwa and her daughter, Shami Mauji, who will be joining us today to talk about their experience with breast cancer. The overall objectives of today's session are to discuss risk factors, symptoms, and screening recommendations for cervical, colon, and breast cancer. We will also introduce the Five to Thrive pillar and focus on the third pillar, which is staying positive. We will hear about a Jamaati member's personal journey with breast cancer, and we will also discuss how to set a spark goal by the end of today's session. Before we get started, we would like the audience to know that any information provided in this webinar should not be considered medical advice and is not intended as a substitute for medical professional help, advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you have regarding your medical care. Without further ado, I will today turn today's session over to Dr. Alicia Nancy, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you so much for that introduction, Arisha. I'm thrilled to be here today to discuss cervical cancer screening, and the objectives for this talk will be to describe the options for cervical cancer screening in Canada, to review the management of abnormal screening tests, and to discuss the benefits of HPV vaccination. So the lifetime risk of developing cervical cancer in Canada is 1.3%, or 1 in 168. The cervix is the bottom part of the uterus, and before cancer develops, the cells of the cervix change and become abnormal. This precancerous condition can develop into cancer over time if not treated. However, most people with precancerous cells do not develop cancer. The main risk factor for developing cancer or precancer of the cervix is the sexually transmitted human papillomavirus, or HPV. HPV is very common. Up to 75% of the population has at least one strain. And this is why screening is offered universally in Canada to anyone with a cervix. So there are three main options for screening for cervical cancer. The first and most common is the pap smear or pap test. This test is usually performed by a family doctor, nurse practitioner, or gynecologist and it requires them to look at the cervix using a speculum. This is placed in the vagina, and then a small spatula or brush is used to lightly scrape cells from the cervix. This sample is then sent to the pathologist who looks at these cells under a microscope to check if they look normal or abnormal. The second option is HPV DNA testing, 
which is performed the same way with a pelvic exam and a speculum exam, but the cells instead are tested for certain types of the HPV virus. In some places, both tests are performed at the same time, and HPV testing is only done if the pap test is abnormal. In the future, people with the cervix may be able to do the HPV DNA test themselves with a self swab. There's actually good evidence that the self swab may be almost as accurate as the test performed by a healthcare provider. There is currently a pilot project in British Columbia where they're testing out this approach to see if it's something that can be done safely and effectively across the rest of the country. So when does screening start and stop? So people with a cervix who are under 21 years old do not need a pap smear or HPV testing, even if they are sexually active. But at the age of 21, you should start getting pap tests and they are done then every three years. Pap tests should be started at the age of 21, even if you've not had intercourse, but had other intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact, or if you are no longer sexually active. In certain parts of Canada where HPV DNA testing is available and funded by the government, that test can be done instead. It starts at age 25 and only needs to be done every five years. If you're not sure if this is something that is available to you, you can always ask your healthcare provider. You can then stop having your pap test at age 65 if you have been having regular pap tests up until that age and if your most recent three pap tests were all normal. So what happens if your screening test is abnormal? First of all, don't panic. We know that cervical cancer is very slow growing and detecting and treating abnormal cells early is very effective at preventing them from developing into cancer. Seeing your provider for regular screening can decrease your chance of developing cervical cancer by up to 70%. And that risk can be decreased even more if you get the HPV vaccine, which I'll discuss shortly. So what happens if your pap test is abnormal? First, you should know that abnormal pap tests are common and most people with an abnormal pap test do not have cancer. Follow-up tests may include an HPV test if you haven't already had one. Your provider may order one at that point. They may also recommend that instead you just repeat your pap test in 12 months. Sometimes if you wait a year, your body can actually get rid of the abnormal cells on its own and your pap test can go back to normal. You may also have an HPV test at that same time. The third option is a colposcopy. For this test, the doctor or nurse will use a speculum to look at your cervix, just like during your pap test, but they'll look more closely using a device that looks like a microscope. They may also take a small biopsy from the cervix, which then they can check for abnormal cells. If it turns out that you have a cervical cancer or precancer, the good news is that there are effective treatments available. And if your condition is found early, there is a very good chance that you can be cured. So what happens if your HPV test is positive? So as a reminder, most people who have sex will be exposed to HPV at some point. And having HPV does not mean that you will definitely get cancer. For most people, in fact, HPV infection goes away on its own, but for some people it does not. Long lasting HPV infection with certain high risk strains increases your risk of cancer over time. If your HPV test comes back positive, your doctor or nurse will talk with you about what to do. In general, if your HPV test is positive, but your pap test is normal, you may just need to repeat the test in six to 12 months, or you may be directly referred for colposcopy. If your HPV test is positive and your pap test is also abnormal, then you'll be referred for colposcopy right away and may receive a biopsy as well. So earlier I mentioned that one of the best ways to decrease your risk of cervical cancer is by getting the HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine is really exciting because it's essentially a vaccine which prevents cervical cancer. HPV vaccination can protect against up to nine strains of HPV, which can lead to cervical, vaginal, vulvar, or anal cancers or genital warts. Vaccination actually works best when it is given prior to the onset of sexual activity. 
because it does not actually get rid of any strains of HPV that a person has already been exposed to, but it prevents them from getting new ones that they have not already been exposed to. The vaccine is recommended in women and girls over the age of nine and protects against genital warts and many anogenital cancers, as I mentioned. The vaccine is also recommended for men between the ages of nine and 27. It can help them not only protect their sexual partners, but can also protect themselves from genital warts and HPV related cancers, including anogenital cancers, as well as head and neck cancers like throat cancer. The vaccine is two doses for those under 15 years old and three doses for those over 15. The HPV vaccine is publicly funded in Canada for children in elementary school. But if you have any difficulty accessing this due to the pandemic, you can always speak with your healthcare provider. The vaccine costs between $300 and $500 out of pocket, but it is also covered by most private drug plans. So it's definitely something that you should speak with your family doctor about. The good news is that this vaccination does not require a booster. So once you've had HPV vaccination, you are protected for life. So some common questions about cervical cancer screening is one, can I get a pap smear every year? So as I mentioned, cervical cancer and precancer is very slow growing. And we know that there is no evidence that for low risk people, yearly pap smears are any better than getting your pap every three years. So you cannot get a pap smear every year, but it does not put you at any increased risk. What if you've had a hysterectomy? So if you've had surgery to remove your uterus, you probably do not need screening if your cervix was removed at the same time and if there was no cervical cancer or precancer in that specimen. If you're not sure, you can always speak with your healthcare provider. So what if you're immunocompromised? So people with a cervix who are immunocompromised, for example, those who are HIV positive or taking immunosuppressive medications for conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's or colitis, usually need more frequent screening, and that usually means a pap smear every year. What if you're having symptoms? So patients who are having symptoms, such as abnormal bleeding, abnormal vaginal discharge, pelvic pain, problems with the bowel or bladder, or a growth that's actually seen on the cervix, should be referred directly to a gynecologist for diagnostic evaluation, not a screening test. And lastly, what if you've already had the HPV vaccine? So although we discussed that getting the vaccine lowers your chances of getting cervical cancer, it of course does not completely protect you. So you should still be screened for cancer or precancer as usual. So some take home points, the most common risk factor for developing cervical cancer is infection with the HPV virus, regular cervical cancer screening with a pap test and or HPV testing can decrease your chance of developing cancer, and HPV vaccination reduces your risk even further and is most effective when given prior to becoming sexually active. Thank you, Dr. Nancy. I will now be handing our presentation over to Dr. Usman Hamid. Dr. Usman Hamid is a surgical oncologist at North York General Hospital in Toronto, who specializes in minimally invasive surgical treatments of gastrointestinal cancers, such as stomach or colorectal cancers. Welcome, Usman. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. We'll be talking a little bit about colorectal cancer. I'll be providing you some background information on uh, colon cancer. We'll talk about the risk factors that um, are at play and how to reduce your risk of developing cancer in the colon. And then we'll talk about some screening tests that are available. So colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer that we see in Canada next to breast and lung cancer. And the vast majority of patients occur in over the age of 50. Despite uh, misconceptions that uh, colon cancer predominantly happens in men, it happens almost in equal incidence. So men and women are both at risk for colorectal cancer. How does colorectal cancer start? So it starts as an abnormal group of cells that form a little clump in the colon that is known by uh, practitioners as polyps. So these little polyps, as they grow, they grow into the deeper layers and they gain the ability to spread to other organs. And that's when it becomes a cancer. So screening tests 
are meant to detect and remove these polyps before they turn into something more worrisome. So what are the, some of the risk factors that uh, put it at a higher chance of developing a colon cancer? So some of the things that we can do to reduce our risk are things like increasing our level of physical activity. So getting off that couch and trying to go for walks more regularly. If you're a little bit overweight, trying to get your weight down, those are very protective at reducing our risk. Trying to maintain a healthy diet, high in fiber and vegetables is very protective. And trying to minimize our intake of processed or red meat uh, are also very helpful. Trying to eliminate uh, unhealthy habits such as smoking and alcohol, even in small amounts will help you to reduce your chance of developing polyps or cancer. And then knowing your family history, it's important to know if any of our grandparents, parents or siblings ever had polyps or colorectal cancer in the, in the past, or even other types of cancers that can run in the family. This will help your healthcare provider determine the next best uh, test for screening and the frequency of tests that are needed. Certain inflammatory conditions like Crohn's and colitis, if you have one of these conditions, it puts you at a higher risk. So make sure that you talk to your healthcare provider about how often you should get screened. So we can divide the population into average risk patients and higher risk patients. So average risk patients are patients that are overall very well. They lie be between the ages of 50 and 74. They have no family history or personal history of polyps or colorectal cancer. If you are one of these patients, then you are eligible for a test to look at traces of stool in your blood. If you are a higher risk patient in that you've noticed a change in your bowel habits, such as blood in the stool, a change in the size or, or diameter of your stool, you've experienced unexplained and unexpected weight loss, or if your healthcare provider has mentioned that you have iron deficiency anemia or a low blood count, or if you yourself or a family member have had polyps or cancer in the colon in the past, then it puts you at a higher risk and you might be eligible for a colonoscopy. Always check your stool. Don't be in a rush to flush the toilet. Make sure that you look for blood or changes in the, in the stool. So the two tests that we use to look for traces of blood in the stool, the traditional test used to be the fecal occult blood test. That required three samples of stool to be tested and uh, checked for uh, traces of stool. It's a little bit more of a difficult test to do because you have to avoid certain foods like red meat prior to the test or certain medications. It does require three samples. This test detects about a third of polyps that are more advanced and about up to 50% of cancers. The newer test that has taken over in most provinces as a recommended test for average risk patients is called the FIT test. It only requires one sample and if it's clear, it can be repeated every two years. It detects more advanced polyps in most cancers, up to 90% of, of cancers. So it's an easier to do test and it's, a bit, it's much more accurate than the traditional test. So you can request a fit kit from a healthcare provider, such as your family practice uh, physician or a nurse practitioner. If you don't have one, you can go to your local lab and request a kit to be sent to you. So this kit, contains um, a dipstick that you can use to check your stool and take a sample. And it includes a mailing address that you can send it in the mail to be checked uh, at the local lab. You should get the result between two to three weeks later. So make sure you follow up to make sure it was clear. If there is blood in the sample, uh, you should go on to proceed with a colonoscopy. It doesn't mean that there's something worrisome like a cancer there. It just means that there's traces of blood. So the next test is a colonoscopy. So the colonoscopy requires a bowel preparation to cleanse the bowel, make sure that we can see when we're doing the procedure. It involves a camera being inserted in the rectum and throughout the colon to evaluate for abnormalities such as polyps. We use gas to inflate the colon to take a good look around. This can be uncomfortable. So most often you get some sedation either with conscious or semi-awake sedation or more deep sedation, depending on the center where you're getting the procedure. 
It involves monitoring. And if you get deep sedation, it's often uh, a second physician that's in charge of your sedation will be present. It's also therapeutic in that if there's any small or medium-sized polyps identified, those can be removed at the same time as the procedure. If there are larger polyps or cancers found, those can be biopsied for later analysis. So colonoscopies are very effective at detecting polyps and cancers. Up to 95% of cancers can be detected this way. There's a very low risk, but a very real risk of bleeding and, and injury to the colon. And it, although it's a low risk, these, these risks must be weighed against the, uh, the risk of the procedure. The frequency after the colonoscopy depends on what we see, depending on the number and the type of polyp uh, we find. Often patients ask about a virtual colonoscopy. So a virtual colonoscopy is only indicated if the patient is unable to have a complete colonoscopy or it's uh, unsafe to do so. It has a similar detection rate as a traditional colonoscopy. It also involves a bowel preparation as well as gas to be inserted. Instead of a camera going up the colon, we use a, a CT scan to take pictures uh, of the colon to look for polyps. If a polyp is identified, those polyps cannot be removed at the same time. You have to come back for another procedure with a colonoscopy. So what happens if you fall outside of the, that age criteria? So if you're too young or too elder for screening. So if you have symptoms such as change in bowel habits, blood in the stool, uh, abdominal pain, unexpected weight loss, or unexplained uh, low iron or low blood count. So you're still eligible for a procedure with a colonoscopy. So talk to your healthcare provider. There is a rising rate of colorectal cancer occurring in younger patients, particularly between the ages of 20 and 40. And so if you have any of these symptoms that are not explained, speak with your healthcare provider about getting colon a colonoscopy. The American Cancer Society has lowered the average age of screening to 45 for asymptomatic patients. If you're older than 74 and you're otherwise fairly well and independent and fit, uh, you may still be eligible for a stool test, such as, such as a fit, uh, for screening. So discuss those pros and cons with your healthcare provider. And again, if you're symptomatic, get checked with the colonoscopy. It's important to get checked when you either first develop symptoms or when you get, uh, sorry, when you have, um, if you're asymptomatic, just with a colon, with a fit test, so that we can check uh, for polyps at an early stage, because we know that patients that have cancer at an earlier stage are much more likely to be cured. So the main take home points today is ensure your screening is up to date if you're eligible. And if you have symptoms, make sure you speak with your family practice or your nurse practitioner about those symptoms as soon as you can so that we can get, get you checked out with the colonoscopy. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Last but not least, we have Dr. Namira Ali Muhammad. She is a medical oncologist at the Tom Baker Cancer Center in Calgary and a clinical associate professor at the University of Calgary. Her clinical areas of expertise include genitourinary and breast oncology. Welcome, Namira. Thank you, Arisha, and thank you for having me here today to talk about breast cancer screening. Today, we'll talk a little bit about the risk of developing breast cancer, as well as we will review the guidelines for screening and help you understand what to do with your results. This picture here just shows us a little bit about the anatomy of the female breast. Normal breast tissue is made up of fatty tissue as well as lobules and ducts. Normally, breast cancer starts out as abnormal cells, usually in the ducts, but sometimes in the lobules. Breast cancer that grows can then spread into the lymph nodes under the armpit. So these are the areas that will be paid attention to when we talk about screening. Breast cancer is very common. It is the second most common cancer in Canada, and in women, it is the number one cause of cancer. About one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime, and we probably all know women who unfortunately have been diagnosed with this disease. 
Every year, about 27,000 women in Canada will be diagnosed with breast cancer. About 83% of cases occur in women who are age 50 and over. The stage at diagnosis is very important when we talk about the outcome or survival with breast cancer. Survival depends on the stage of diagnosis. So if we find a breast cancer at an early stage when the tumor is small, that means a higher chance of cure. Stage one breast cancers are usually those that are small and less than two centimeters within the breast only. Stage two breast cancers are those that might be slightly larger, two to five centimeters with some lymph node involvement under the armpit or those tumors that are more than five centimeters. Stage three breast cancers are those which are usually larger than five centimeters with more lymph nodes involved. And stage four breast cancer is breast cancer that has spread beyond the breast to other parts of the body, like the bones or the lungs or the liver. What's important to remember is that stage one to three breast cancer is treated with curative intent. And more than 80% of breast cancer cases are diagnosed early at stage one or two. The probability of surviving breast cancer in Canada, which means being alive at least five years after the diagnosis, is 88%. So earlier detection definitely translates to a higher chance of cure. Who is at risk of breast cancer? There are some men who can develop breast cancer, but by far the vast majority of cases are in women. In females, the risk of breast cancer increases with age. So at a young age, only one in 50 women will develop breast cancer. However, as we get older, our risk, our risk increases. There are other risk factors to keep in mind. Your family history is important. It's important to talk to your family members if they've ever had a breast cancer or ovarian cancer or other types of cancer. If you or anyone in your family has had a gene mutation, such as a BRCA gene mutation, that's an important risk factor. There are other factors that we cannot change, such as our reproductive status. So if you have not had menopause until later in life, that gives you a slightly higher risk, as well as hormone exposures such as estrogen can also increase the risk slightly of breast cancer. There are, however, some things we can control. So we know that no alcohol intake is important to reduce the risk of breast cancer. Being overweight or obese after menopause also increases the risk of breast cancer. And physical inactivity, the same as for colon cancer, also increases the risk of breast cancer. So who should get screened for breast cancer and what does that mean? First of all, screening is for those who have no symptoms or concerns in the breasts. So for most women aged 50 to 74 who have normal breasts, they haven't noticed any changes, we should be getting a mammogram every two years. The data has shown that women in this age category have a lower risk of dying from breast cancer when they are screened regularly. And in many provinces, you can even self-refer for a mammogram. If you're younger than age 50, so if you're between the age of 40 to 40 to 49, talk to your care provider about your individual risk. Women over the age of 75 as well, you should talk to your care provider about your individual risk. Usually, if you're healthy with minimal medical conditions, we would still recommend getting screened regularly beyond the age of 75 as well. But talk to your physician about that. Some women may have a higher risk of breast cancer. So we know that the majority of women with breast cancer do not have a genetic cause that has increased their risk. But a very small percentage of breast cancer cases are related to underlying genetic mutations, which may increase your risk of breast cancer or other cancers. Those genes, for example, are the BRCA1 or 2. For patients who are known to have a higher risk, that, that might include patients that have a known genetic mutation, have a personal or family history of breast or ovarian cancer, or previously have had radiation therapy to the chest, those patients should have a different screening plan than the mammograms every two years. So again, talk to your care provider if you think you fall into that category of higher risk. What can we expect at a mammogram? So a mammogram is, is a test. It's coming in for a diagnostic test like an x-ray. You'll be greeted by a technologist 
and you'll be asked to put on a gown from the waist up. The actual test itself involves having your breast placed on a bottom plate that you see here, and then a machine compresses the breast from the top. So another plastic place, plate is lowered and compresses the breast. The compression itself might be slightly uncomfortable, but this process takes approximately 10 to 15 seconds per breast. The technologist is with you to help you get into the right position, and you can always let them know if you're uncomfortable. Usually two pictures are taken on each side, and the whole test itself, including getting into the right position and getting changed into your clothes after, takes about 30 minutes. As you prepare for a mammogram, you should book the appointment for a time when your breasts are not tender. You should try to avoid caffeine the week before and after, and you should also avoid the week before and after your period. On the day of your appointment, remember to wear a two-piece outfit as you'll be asked to wear a gown from the top up. We ask that you do not use deodorants, antiperspirants, body lotions, or powders as they may affect the accuracy of the mammogram. So sometimes there, there are components in deodorants that can show up as little spots on the mammogram. It's also important that as you prepare for your mammogram, you book a follow-up appointment with your care provider to discuss the results. We know that mammograms are safe. They do use a low dose of radiation, but the, there's important information which is gained from that. These tests, however, are not perfect and some cancers may get missed. So it's important to get screened regularly. And in between mammograms, if you notice any changes, report those to your care provider. It's also important to remember that some concerns found on a mammogram are not cancer. This may lead to biopsies or other tests, and we call that overdiagnosis. Recently, we've also realized that recent COVID vaccination can cause abnormalities in the lymph nodes under the armpit. So if you've had a COVID vaccine recently, make sure you book the mammogram for two weeks out and let the technologist know when your last vaccine was. With all of that being said, the benefits of a mammogram definitely outweigh these caveats because finding a breast cancer early is better than finding it late. What happens with your test results? So usually the results can take one to two weeks to reach your care provider. Remember that not all abnormal results mean breast cancer. Some women might need further testing. They may be called back for additional mammogram views. Some women might, be, might need an ultrasound, an MRI, or even a biopsy. And some women may need more frequent testing. So if you have a higher breast density, you might need to come back in a year, but the first mammogram will tell you when to come back for the next one. What's important is to follow up on your results and understand your results. Make sure you ask your care provider all of those questions to ensure that you understand what your test results mean and when to come back for your next mammogram. So what should you be doing? All women should discuss mammograms with their care provider and you should get screened regularly. So as a reminder, women aged 50 to 74 should have mammograms every two years. And these are women with normal breasts with no concerns. Think about your modifiable risk factors. So we should be increasing our physical activity, decreasing alcohol intake, stop smoking, and increase fruits, vegetables, and grains in your diet. Know your body if there are any changes. Report those breast changes immediately to your care provider and they can assess you and get you set up with the right tests. There are some symptoms which would be concerning. For example, if you notice a lump in the breast or armpit, if you have a nipple that is inverted or pointed inwards when it never was before, if there's any crusting, bleeding, or a rash on your nipple, if there's unusual fluid or discharge coming from your nipple, or dimpling or thickening of the skin, those are all concerns that you should bring up right away with your care provider. To summarize, breast cancer screening is important. Get screened regularly because finding a breast cancer early improves outcomes. Know your family history, and if there are any concerns that you notice in your breasts, report them to your care provider.
There are lots of resources available online. If you're looking for more information on breast cancer screening, there are some resources here you can go to. Thank you, Dr. Ali Mohammed. Before I introduce our next two guests, Shirin Jiwa and Shamin Mauji, I would like to show this BC Cancer video where Shirin and Shamin talk about their heartfelt journey with breast cancer. My name is Shirin and I have two beautiful children, three amazing grandchildren, and I have a wonderful son-in-law. I had a mammogram appointment and I was a little bit stressed out because my husband was not feeling well and I thought I should skip this time. My mom did feel very uh, tired, exhausted. She didn't want to go for her mammogram. It was my birthday. I said, Mom, this would be the greatest gift you gave me if you came for a mammogram. When I went for my mammogram, after two days, the cancer agency called me. They found out I had a very small lump. They did my biopsy. I went to see my doctor, and when she told me that, yes, I have breast cancer, I just fell apart. I was thinking whether is this true? Do I really have cancer? I had to go for the surgery. The support from her oncologist, from her doctor, from our family members, we just felt so positive. The support from my family and my positive attitude really helped me. And that gave me so much strength. It has humbled us all. It really has humbled us all. She glues us, she binds us together. I can't imagine my life without her. This was really important for us, that she survived this. And that's why the mammogram is so important. I'm going to be cancer-free this year, five years. I'm so grateful that the mammogram saved my life. I, I would advise everybody, please, please get it done. Welcome, Sharon and Shaman. We are thankful to have you part of this webinar to share your story. I do have a few questions that I would like to ask you. Sharon, what was your experience like getting a mammogram? Of course, when we know we have to go for a mammogram, we get a bit anxious and nervous because we all know that it is not a comfortable feeling. But remember, it isn't unbearable pain, but rather a little bit of discomfort. The procedure takes only a few minutes. Please keep in mind, no pain, no gain. Fortunately for me, my cancer was caught at a very early stage and was treatable. It's empowering to know that there are things we can do to take care for our own health. And how did you face the diagnosis? I was very scared of the word cancer because I was scared of the unknown. But the support I had from my family, my oncologist, that gave me strength to face and beat cancer. I knew my first meeting with the oncologist may have been very overwhelming for me. I needed my daughter's support because it was very hard to comprehend what was happening. Shaming was there for support because I was feeling, I was feeling scared of the unknown, what the outcome would be. And what are some strategies that you implemented to help you stay positive throughout this journey? After my 16 rounds of intense radiation, I pulled myself together and decided to take a very positive approach to my life. I started to eat very healthy. I started to work out and lift weights in my home gym. Instead of spending money on a gym membership, I built a small home gym so that I could have a daily routine in the comfort of my home. I practice meditation. 
I always think for I, I always think positive and I never forget to give gratitude for my new life every day. The new lifestyle and the daily activities are part of my everyday life and has given me strength, courage to continue living in a very positive manner. Thank you, Sharon, for your heartfelt message and sharing your story with all of us. My next question is for Shaman. Witnessing your mom's experience with her breast cancer journey, I'm sure you learned a lot by being her, by her side throughout this experience. What are your thoughts on screening and its importance? Um, of course, pre-screening for cervical cancer is also very important. Um, as daunting as a task it may be, a pap test is paramount to prevention of cervical cancer. Of course, I do get nervous and anxious as soon as I walk into my doctor's office, but right away, my doctor puts me at ease. She calms my nerves and she just makes me feel really comfortable. She walks me through the process step by step. The pap smear causes a bit of discomfort, but the exam only lasts a few minutes. And those minutes are really worthwhile. Early detection of any kind of cell abnormality can be diagnosed very early on. So pre-screening for non-communicable diseases is important. And by doing so, you're taking a very proactive approach to your health and well-being. Thank you, Sharon and Shaman. Those are really kind and very wise words that I'm glad our audience gets to hear. So how do we put all this knowledge into action? Putting it into practice in our lives is just as important as learning about it. So we want to introduce you to something called SMART goals. And this is a process. It teaches you how to set steps to make these goals achievable, which can increase motivation and also sets you up for success. Each letter in the word SMART stands for something. S stands for specific. What is your goal? The more specific, the better. M is for measurable. How will you measure your goal? Keep track of your progress with this goal. A is for attainable. How will you achieve your goal? R is for relevant. How will this goal help you? And what are you hoping this goal will help you improve? And lastly, T is for timely. When will you complete this goal? I would like to invite Shaman to share with us how we can set a SMART goal for cancer screening. So we could start off with the letter S. What is your goal? So my goal for the letter S is to start out by getting my routine screening pap test. And how will you measure this goal? Um, I will schedule an appointment uh, with my healthcare professional uh, for a pap test in the next two weeks. Great. And how will you achieve this goal? Uh, I will make sure to attend my appointment and to follow up with the results. And how will this goal help you? Uh, this will help me uh, be healthier and confident uh, that I'm doing everything possible to look after myself. Perfect. And when will you complete this goal by? I will complete this goal, uh, the screening and follow up by June the 10th, for example. Perfect. This is a great goal, Shaman, and I'm sure that most of our audience can use this as an example to create their own SMART goal and take their own health into their own hands. Thank you so much, Shaman. You're welcome. I would like to introduce our Five to Thrive infographic where we incorporate healthy habits into our daily lives. Visit iicanada.org for more information on the Five to Thrive habits. In this slide, we are specifically looking at the third pillar, which is staying positive. As we think about cancer screening, it's normal to face complex emotions as we get tested, wait for results, or experience challenges in our health. Staying positive has beneficial impacts for our, our overall health and well-being, and we'd like to share five ways you can incorporate this into your life. The first way we can implement staying positive into our lifestyle is by taking 60 seconds out of your day to smile. Studies show that this can improve your mood and make you feel happier. Another way to stay positive can be by practicing gratitude. You can do this by writing three things every day that you are grateful for. You can also stay positive by connecting with nature. 
whether this is going out for walks, hiking, or even staying connected to nature with indoor plants, we can improve our mood and reduce stress from these fun and easy activities. The fourth way to help you stay positive can be by having an emotional plan. This can look like a journal that you use at the beginning of your day to write down what actions you can take to overcome certain emotions. For example, if you find yourself feeling upset, you will take three deep breaths or you can go for a five minute walk. Last but not least, we have practicing self-compassion as a fifth way to stay positive. Self-compassion is an act that can be difficult, but takes practice and becomes easier over time. If you find yourself in an emotional and difficult situation, this is the most important time to be kind to yourself. The same way that you comfort or support a friend in time of a need, it is exactly the kind of support and comfort you would provide and tell yourself. Visit iicanada.org for more ways you can incorporate staying positive. Well, this brings us to the conclusion of our webinar today. We would just like to ask our panelists one takeaway key message to share with our audience. Let's start with Dr. Alicia Nancy. So I just wanted to remind everyone that regular cervical cancer screening with a pap test and or HPV testing can decrease your chance of developing cancer and HPV vaccination reduces your risk even further. Thank you, Dr. Nancy. Let's now hear from Dr. Usman Hamid. I just wanted to remind everyone that um, colorectal cancer is preventable, treatable, and beatable. In the last two years of the pandemic, if you haven't gotten some sort of screening test, whether it's a FIT test or if you're due for your colonoscopy, speak with your healthcare provider. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. And let's move on to Dr. Namira Ali Mohammed. Just wanted to remind everyone that breast cancer is very common, but the earlier we find a breast cancer and diagnosis and treat and treat it, the better the outcomes are. So talk to your care provider about getting screened with a mammogram. Thank you, Dr. Ali Mohammed. And finally, let's hear a take home message from Shirin Jiwa and Shaman Mauji. Mammograms don't prevent breast cancer, but it can save your life by detecting breast cancer as early as possible. Non-communicable diseases such as breast cancer and cervical cancer, if detected early by pre-screening, gives you a greater chance of cure and a greater chance of survival. Thank you, Sharon and Shaman, and thank you, everyone. I would like to thank our experts, Dr. Alicia Nancy, Dr. Usman Hamid, and Dr. Namira Ali Mohammed for sharing their knowledge, experience, and expertise. I would also like to thank Sharon Jiwa and Shaman Mauji for sharing their story and experience with the rest of us. I hope you enjoyed the last hour and learned many new things about cancer screening. For everyone who has registered and provided their consent in the registration form, we will follow up with you in a month to see where you're at and how you're doing with your SMART goals and today's tips. Thank you. Thank you.